Proceed in the matter of the state of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris. We're down for motions. Before we get into uh, the day's proceedings, uh, we have Rule 22s, Channel 5, Channel 2, Channel 11. What says the staff? Uh, we have taken a position to go. What says the defense? We object. All right, I'll sign off on them over objection. Uh, All right, let's proceed, please. Judge, if we could uh, have you direct the sheriff to allow this. What did I do the last time? Okay. Allow him to have his hand through the Oh, well, consistency. It's the hot goblin of small minds, but I'll do it. Did I do both? I thought I just did one. I'm pretty sure I just did one. And if I didn't, I'm going to do one. One is good enough. I'm going to assert my business, but I'm privilege, Your Honor. I certainly would. Thank you. 
the, uh, the motion is very short, Judge. It's um, just two or three pages, not really laid out in here what I need the court to consider, what we're asking for. Uh, as the court obviously is well aware, the case has uh, attracted a lot of attention both locally and nationally. Um, the um, defense in this case uh, previously filed a motion to close the courtroom during evidentiary hearings prior to trial. We had a fairly lengthy hearing, and I went through at that time uh, with the court all of the coverage, well, not all of the coverage, but certainly a sampling of the coverage, both locally and nationally, in print, internet, television, whatnot. That motion was denied. So since that time, we have, we have been back in court a number of times, sometimes arguing motions, sometimes not. Uh, and each and everything that we have done in court has been extensively uh, covered. The case has continued to um, attract uh, local and national media attention. And as I've, I've laid out um, paragraphs three, four, five, six, seven, even the most mundane matters have garnered um, front page attention in the local papers. Uh, so I want to, just to perfect the record, I want to uh, introduce two exhibits. Uh, exhibit one is uh, photocopies of news articles from the Merida Daily Journal and from the, I believe some from the Atlanta Journal as well. from September of 2015 through the end of the year, and Exhibit 2 would be corresponding Merida Daily Journal articles and Atlanta Journal, Journal articles from January and February of 2016. So that's Exhibits 1 and 2. I've shown these to the state. I would offer those just to perfect the record, Judge. We don't have any objection, Your Honor. And then, I, I don't see any point in doing what we did before, Judge, and going back through each each motion. I mean, excuse me, each article and talking about what each one discusses. I'm going to give those to the court and uh, and, and let you take a look. But uh, the point is very clear: everything, everything that we've done has been covered very thoroughly. In, in the local papers, uh, often, um, often on the very front page, often the lead story. Uh, as I have pointed out, as far as the most recent coverage, February the 5th, 2016, uh, all we had was a status conference case. That was the front page of the Mary Daily Journal. We had no hearing on that day, on February the 5th. Uh, but, but nonetheless, on February the 6th, um, it's the lead story that we didn't do anything that day. Uh, and that was in the uh, Mary and David Journal, essentially reporting that the case had been rescheduled. As I point out in paragraph 7, um, the mere fact that Mr. Harris's wife had filed for a divorce garner front page status on both the Marriott paper and the Atlanta paper on February 12, 2016. So um, I, I want to point out my recollection is every time we've been in court there's been Rule 22. Every time that we've had something scheduled to, to my recollection we've had a who had a camera in the courtroom. Um, my recollection is every time that we've appeared, there have been media in the courtroom. Um, and for the record today, uh, obviously we have media people outside, but we also have some inside, uh, including the uh, representatives from the Merida Daily Journal, the Atlanta Journal, and I, I believe 
uh, national uh, correspondent uh, from NBC. NBC? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what we're asking the court to do is, now that we have, have heard the suppression motions, now that we have heard the constitutional issues, and all that's been covered, everything that we've done has been covered, and uh, a lot of uh, materials that, uh, a lot of information that uh, we think should not have been disclosed prior to trial has, has been covered. What we're asking the court to do is to please allow us just to argue our motions in limine after we after we've selected a jury. And I think that I think that request is uh, very reasonable under the circumstances, and because of the uh, nature of, of the offenses charged and the nature of the uh, very high profile uh, nature of the case, um, as I pointed out in paragraph 10, in limine means preliminarily presented only to the judge before or during trial or raised preliminarily, especially because of an issue about the admissibility of evidence believed by the movement to be prejudicial. That's from the Black's Law Dictionary. Of course, the harm that is sought to be prevented in motions in limine is, is the very asking of the question about a subject, subject matter, or a particular piece of evidence in trial. Just the very, just the very question. That's the harm that we, we seek to prevent. And you know, anything that we Anything that we go over in a motion to eliminate, any particular pieces of evidence of an inherently prejudicial nature, which we're going to be seeking to exclude, it's all going to be public knowledge. Everything. It's all going to be covered by the media. It's, it's almost, um, it almost makes it pointless to even, to, to even have such a motion. Just going to be in public domain, and so um, and we're also concerned, Judge, with you know if we if we're if we're arguing for the exclusion of certain prejudicial matters in limited. Now, the media covers the court's rulings as well as the evidence, and and you know our position is that creates a real problem because then then the, the court's imprimatur as to the evidence. Well, it, it, it could be misconstrued in the way it's reported, um, but it certainly becomes part of the, the, the public domain. And so we think that that makes it doubly problematic, that we're not, it's not only the evidence, but it's the court's rulings. And so uh, for these reasons, we, we think that uh, since the court is not close the courtroom as we requested. We think a reasonable compromise would be, well, at this juncture, we heard the constitutional matters, we heard the suppression matters, the unlimited matters, that which is inherently prejudicial, as we believe. We ask that we just hold those. Let's hold, let's hear those after we select jury. And at that point in time, we've got much We've got much better opportunities to to select a jury here locally that's not been completely um, made up their mind based on what they read in the newspaper or hear on the news. Now, I, I know the state is going to argue a couple of things. Uh, certainly, they're going to argue, well, how we can't get ready for trial. We don't know what's coming in, what's not coming in. Well, I was. I would suggest the court knows better than that. That um, Mr. Reynolds has announced almost from the time of, of arrest, they were ready for trial. They're ready. They're ready. They, that, that's been the mantra that's been repeated over and over and over. Um, there, there's no limit to the amount of individuals that, that the state can have working on the case to, to, to 
prepare witnesses and go get witnesses and get them to court. It's like any other case. You subpoena the witnesses that you think you're going to need. If it turns out they're not going to testify, you don't call them to testify. Or if the court excludes what that witness is going to testify about, they're excluded. But the preparation is the same. So I, I would uh, I would urge the court to see to see through that kind of argument. And then the second argument I, I believe Mr. Boyne has indicated um, previously would be that well, we can't voir dire the jury about these matters if, if, if we don't go ahead and hear them now. Exactly. That's exactly right. Because it's not in the public domain. We, we, we don't want to have to voir dire the jurors about every little thing that the court has possibly excluded as unduly prejudicial. And so I think that uh, that argument really makes our point, Judge, that um, we, we, we're a long way down the road now to, um, uh, to, to, to put things in, in the public eye that may jeopardize our ability to uh, collect a jury, may jeopardize um, Mr. Harris's ability to have a fair trial. So I would ask the court to please grant us this compromise and just allow us, let, let's hear these kinds of motions in limine after we've selected a jury. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, kind of picking up where Mr. Kilgore left off about the issue of compromise. Uh, the state would be more than willing to talk and possibly compromise about hearing some motions in limine after jury selection, things like that, depending on what the nature of the motion that is filed by the defense is. The problem is, I have no way of knowing what they're going to file. We haven't had a motion in limiting files until last Friday. Um, that was in response to the state's other activists, which we feel is something that needs to be heard before jury selection. Um, there, there are three very smart, creative defense attorneys over there, and as far as what motions they end up filing, they are only bound by their creativity as to what issues they're going to raise and how they're going to raise them. For the state to sit here and concede and say, yes, let's hear it all after jury selection, and then we have these motions in limine that really have a substantive effect on this trial, depending on what Your Honor rules. Uh, that could put us in a very tough bind. And I'll turn your attention to a recent case that happened in Fulton County, or the Supreme Court ruled a couple weeks ago, Otis versus the state. It was a murder case. There were issues that came up after the jury had been selected and during an opening statement. Because of that, all the parties scrambled. A decision was made, and the case was continued, a mistrial was granted. The Supreme Court held that that person who had been charged with stabbing two people and killing one of them could not be retried because double jeopardy barred a retrial in that case because of something that came up after the jury was selected and jeopardy attached. And I think if we go down that road uh, regarding things that are as important to the case as to what witnesses are going to be allowed and what type of evidence is going to be allowed, I think we're setting ourselves up for a dangerous proposition. Um, so to, to start with, regarding the, the taint to the jury pool, uh, this motion's date is scheduled, we're almost seven weeks out from trial. Uh, there will be a seven week delay between any rulings by your honor on motions heard today and the time we actually select a jury. Um, if, let's say, we have a jury, we select them, then they, we, we argue motions before they actually come in for opening statements. We do that. And let's say we have an issue, jurors sometimes do, disregard your honor's charge not to watch the media, not to do this, not to do that. And then we have jurors who actually see the media saturation of your rulings after they're already sworn. We have a big problem at that point, Judge. So I think delaying this uh, would practically and legally speaking, uh, at least for the motions that have been filed thus far, would be uh, a dangerous thing. So I would ask that we go ahead and hear the motions that have been filed. Um, I think that this will help also, I know Mr. Kilgore approached, or brought up the fact that, you know, I guess the state, we have endless resources. Uh, I think Mr. Kilgore worked in the DA's office and he knows this isn't the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's office. We do have some resources, but it does take a lot of preparation 
and a lot of work to get people in from out of state, from around the state, especially in a case like this. So it would be practical for both sides going into opening statements, going into jury selection even, knowing what's going to be coming before the jury and what questions to ask. Uh, the new evidence code actually sets out and encourages that matters be dealt with pre-trial, that rulings be had on the admissibility of evidence to make things go more smoothly and to give the opportunity for the uh, parties to make their arguments before they're in a state where jeopardy has attached. Um, I think that to say that there are a lot of things that are going to come out in the media or in the courtroom uh, that could further taint the jury pool or things of that nature, uh, this has been extensively aired, the facts of the case have been extensively aired from the probable cause hearing on since the inception of this case. Uh, so I don't think that that is going to have a great deal of prejudice ruling on many of these same issues that we would have to argue anyway. Um, again, if we do get motions in limiting from the defense that are something that we could agree to handle that we don't think would sub substantially affect uh, the admission of evidence and things of that nature, as we get sometimes motions not to call the victim the victim, call them the alleged victim. We get a motion to do this or that. Uh, those are things that obviously could be handled post jury selection. But to do this now with substantive evidence, I think that that, that danger uh, is is too great. And I would ask them to go ahead and hear at least the motions that we have before us now. Uh, I would ask that we hear them today. Thank you. You have further to say, Mr. Phillips. Well, just real, real, real briefly so the court understands, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Otis case that we were going to speak about, but that had nothing to do with a piece of evidence that came out after jury selection. That had to do with a legal argument and a, and a uh, court ruling. Um, that's going to happen in every case. There's going to be disagreements about what the law is. Um, so I don't, I don't think that case is a very good analogy for, for you to consider um, for this matter. Uh, and the second thing you mentioned, well, uh, we don't have unlimited resources. We're, we're not the FBI. Well, as a matter of fact, we just received information that the state is receiving assistance from the FBI in this very case. And so I think for him to suggest that, well, we, we don't, uh, we're not the FBI. That's, <coughs> frankly, that's misleading. Um, I, I'm, I'm just asking the court uh, uh, it's not going to take us a week to go through some motions and limiting once we've selected a jury but it certainly might shorten substantially shorten the time it takes for us to get a jury if we just simply wait and hold those motions until after a jury is selected uh, I, frankly I see absolutely no reason why the court wouldn't would not just hold these motions until we have it. Well, it's a matter of balancing concerns about jury selection as opposed to um, yeah, the clear directions in the evidence code. You go ahead and get motions and let me done that in advance uh, to streamline trial preparation for the parties. Um, I don't see today's hearing impacting jury selection, given all of the coverage that's already gone uh, ahead. I just don't see that. So we'll go ahead and have our hearings. So I deny your motion, Mr. Gilmore. Judge, I'm going to ask for a written report on that, please. Yes, if you'll submit one. I ask that the state submit it since you moved against us. I don't mind doing that. Thank you. But you might be happier with your language if you do it yourself. motion that we have then, Judge, uh, motion 19 is a motion limited to exclude any evidence of a life insurance policy. 
And again, it's uh, it's very short. I've laid that out um, in writing. Mm -hmm. um, upon notice from the state, uh, we believe it, it intends to introduce evidence of one or more life insurance policies on the life of Cooper Harris, uh, where a defendant and or his spouse are uh, beneficiaries. Um, and I know the court did not preside over the uh, probable cause hearing in July 2014, but at that time, the state certainly suggested to the magistrate excuse me, that, the, uh, that life insurance was a motive for the killing of Cooper Harris. Now, we've obviously re received discovery material over the last year or so in the case, and we've, we've reviewed discovery material. Uh, and based on the material that have, has been provided to us, there's no evidence of um, insurance motive or financial motive uh, that, that, that we received. Um, in paragraph 4, Judge, I sort of lay out um, kind of what the rule is in Georgia. In order to permit, permit evidence of an insurance policy, there must be some independent evidence of a nexus between the crime charged and the existence of the insurance policy. The erroneous admission of an insurance policy has the enormous potential for so infecting and inflaming the trial process that fundamental fairness can be easily compromised. That is from Stoudemire, S-T-O-U-D-E-M-I-E-R-E -E -E, versus the state, 261 Georgia, 49. That's a 1991 decision. I do have copies of that for the state, for the court. Got the discovery material that we received, Judge. <clears throat> Includes um, includes a recording from the jail, wherein Mr. Uh, Harris is is speaking with his father and his brother, and Mr. Harris's brother, who is a police officer, um, is assisting, trying to assist um, Ross in, um, you know. These are the things that we need to do as far as making sure your bills are paid, as, as far as things are taken care of a house, how can we help your wife, things of that nature. And it's Mr. Harris's brother who brings up um, the subject of an insurance uh, policy and asks, asks Mr. Harris something to the effect of, hey, is there, is there an insurance policy? Do you, do you have insurance? In which, uh, in, in response, of course, Mr. Harris responds and gives the information. So there's there's nothing been provided to us in discovery outside of that to suggest that Mr. Harris, on his own accord, somehow sought to cash in on an insurance policy where he was the beneficiary. Um, we've not been provided any discovery to suggest that um, Mr. Harris has any sort of financial difficulties whatsoever, that he was somehow behind in bills, that he was being evicted, that he was losing his vehicle, um, that he had received notice that he was being terminated, N nothing like that whatsoever to suggest financial difficulties. There's nothing in the discovery material that we've been provided that uh, um, suggests that Mr. Harris made uh, phone calls to the insurance company to to, uh, to to verify the policy in close proximity to to, to Cooper's death. Um, so there's just there's been nothing like that in the discovery judge that would um, that would show any kind of uh, any kind of nexus uh, that uh, Stoudemire is, is talking about. got a case um, that I want to share with the court just for a matter of comparison. Yeah, just... 
This is uh, Bridges versus the state, 286 Georgia 535. It's a 2010 decision of the Georgia Supreme Court. I could direct the court to Division 4. Same sort of issue here. <clears throat> of course, quoting Stoudemire, the court realizes there must be some independent evidence of a nexus between the crime charged and the existence of an insurance policy. Well, in that particular case, apparently, Bridges asked his wife's employer about insurance proceeds on the day uh, the murder was discovered. He made it clear to others that he wanted and needed the insurance money. And he explained to fellow inmates that as a result of his commission of the murder, he would be receiving a large sum uh, in insurance proceeds. So I'll give you Bridges, Judge, just so you can see kind of what the court looks at um, as to uh, information that would be sufficient uh, to, to warrant the uh, inclusion of this kind of evidence. Uh, in the discovery we received, Judge, we just we just don't have it. Uh, so I would ask uh, that you would um, direct the state not to uh, ask any questions or place in evidence anything regarding any life insurance policy. Your Honor, I actually will uh, ask the whole law and argue that in total. I believe his next motion also goes to the 404B notice we filed. So I would just ask to be able to argue the R404B notice in response to that all at once. Do you have a problem with that? Frankly, Judge, there's separate motions. I'd rather hear what you've got to say on this particular motion now. Okay. Your Honor, regarding this, uh, the state has filed a 404 B notice, and I'll go over that in more detail in a little bit. But we have uh, one of the things that we've given notice of are, is the discussion of, about or seeking to uh, admit evidence. Uh, which, if you look at the 404B notice, would be the sixth general nature of evidence uh, uh, prong. Evidence showing defendant's state of mind regarding his family's financial status and his employment situation in the months, weeks, and days leading up to and after the murder of Cooper Harris. Uh, included in that, we did cite one of the things that we would be wanting, wanting to show would be uh, the existence of life insurance. Um, but first of all, I know that the Stoudemire case, just to point out, Your Honor, if you've read that one, uh, that basically was the party stipulated to a life insurance policy. It was admitted, and zero questions or issues were asked during the trial, and no nexus whatsoever from the party to the policy was brought up. Uh, and the Supreme Court in that case did find that the, case, the trial should be reversed based on that. Um, the nexus, uh, in this case, Judge, there are several things that go into the financial aspect of this. Um, in the statement from the defendant's wife, she talked about how he had taken over the finances approximately six months beforehand. Um, we have texts where her, she's wanting to talk about budget issues. The defendant himself says they got some balances that had gone up, but they were working on them. Just various things like that, which in and of themselves maybe aren't a big deal, but when you tie it all together, it shows his state of mind as you approach the day of Cooper's death. Um, in addition to that, regarding um, the defendant's employment, which ties into this same uh, general nature of evidence that we're seeking to admit, uh, the defendant, uh, through discussions with uh, online, with uh, his wife, things of that nature, talked about being unhappy at his job at that time. He actually had uh, applied for a job and interviewed for another job back about a month before the incident and was very upset when he did not get that job. Um, I'm just saying that this ties into this entire problem of the financial uh, status and employment leading up in the months, weeks, and days leading up to this. Um, you know, I'll turn your attention to a couple of cases that talk about nexus in addition to the one that the defense talked about. Uh, Bagwell versus the state, which is 270, Georgia 175. Uh, that's a 1998 Supreme Court case. There was a nexus found in that case where the uh, defendant had talked after the murder about knowing about policies and they noted that in fact the defendant in that case took this policy out and there was a, a lack of emotion at the time of the, the crime and immediately after uh, the, the, the victim in that case was, was found deceased. Uh, also Slackman versus the state which is 280 Georgia 837 2006 Supreme Court case again citing that they knew of the existence 
the defendant knew the existence of the life insurance policy because he had, in fact, procured it. He talked about it immediately after. In this case, there was a life insurance policy on Cooper, uh, an initial one for about $2,000. Uh, then in 2012, I believe it was November of 2012, uh, Mr. Harris chose to up that to an additional $25,000 in life insurance. Uh, on the, the victim in this case. Now, I, admittedly, this is not the main motive of this case, as you've heard through our other motions and things like that, but we believe that this uh, helps complete the story and it's relevant that the defendant knew he had a policy on his side at this time, and it was one of the number of reasons that would have left to and eased his attempt to escape from uh, the family dynamic. Je I will say, uh, Your Honor, that uh, this is something that if Your Honor wants, what we may agree to do, uh, depending on your ruling as well, we would not mention this in opening statements or go into it whatsoever and see if we actually establish the nexus at that point and would uh, bring it up to Your Honor outside the presence of the jury to, to get a ruling at that point to see, just to be careful as to whether we actually have made that nexus. But uh, I believe based on what we have, we actually do have uh, a nexus to admit this. Uh, while not the main motive in the case, it is a factor when you look at all the pieces of the puzzle in this case. Nothing that he has just told the court suggested a direct nexus. Um, and he argued almost apologetically that, oh, well, it's not our main motive. Uh, well, there's no evidence that it's motive at all. You, you, you heard nothing about actual financial difficulties. You heard nothing about the fact that they were, they were um, about to lose their apartment, about to lose their car. is exactly what Mr. Bourne suggests. <clears throat> um, in essence, I'm going to grant the motion in limine at this point. Uh, when and if the state feels that a nexus has been developed appropriately, uh, you can approach the bench with counsel. We can develop it on the record, uh, as the case may be. And uh, I'll consider the admissibility of the evidence at that point. All right. Next item. <coughs> Motion 18, Judge. I'm sorry, did you say 18? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. In motion 18, this is our motion in limine to exclude bad character evidence. This is our, uh, our motion, I guess, in counterpart to the state's uh, filing of a notice of intent to present um, other acts evidence under 24-4-404B. Uh, and what we're, what we're asking the court to do is exclude bad character evidence. Judge, do you have a copy of my motion? Okay. Got a list um, in paragraph seven. Um, seven. Paragraph seven. I'm looking. And this is a this is a list of categories. This is not a list of specific uh, specific acts or specific pieces of evidence, uh, but essentially categories um, of matters um, which we're asking the court to exclude from the trial of the case, that being any reference, comment, or examination on these kind of matters through witness testimony, digital evidence, physical evidence, or argument of counsel. Um, now, I've laid those out there, again, in general categories, but we're going to refer to them basically as 
uh, as uh, evidence of a uh, sexual nature for purposes of this hearing um, is, is how I'm going to refer to it, Judge. And just generally, we're objecting to the admission of such uncharged acts um, where they're, they're not raised just day. They're not related to the uh, charge of murder. They're not relevant or connected to the murder charge. These are uncharged acts which cannot constitute motive to commit murder. Uncharged acts which constitute merely bad character and where any probative value is substantially outweighed by the unduly prejudicial effect. Now, Judge, my, my starting point is, um, is really taking a look at the, the state's brief that it filed in our severance motion. And, um, you know, our position is that the the issue of severance is uh, <coughs> really inextricably intertwined with your consideration of, of this type of what we'll call, again, uh, sexual um, evidence. And of course, the state argued in that, that brief, as I expect them to do today, that what, what this is really is motive. All of this, these uh, sexual materials that I've got laid out in paragraph seven, it's all about motive. Uh, and so I want to address that, that first. <clears throat> um, and in a nutshell, they're suggesting that uh, any sexually explicit, explicit digital communications or acts of uh, infidelity or whatnot constitutes evidence of motive for the murder. Right, for Mr. Harris to kill his child. And I, I, I think the only way that we can address that suggestion is to discuss what we have actually, uh, what's been turned over to us in discovery. So in the discovery that we've received, there's no, nothing to evidence a willingness uh, on the part of Mr. Harris to do violence toward Cooper Harris, um, or to any, anyone else for that matter. There's no evidence in the discovery that we've received uh, that there's any kind of history of neglect of Cooper Harris. There certainly was no evidence in the discovery that he was in, in need of anything. Um, in fact, what's been, what's been turned over to us, Judge, um, is that uh, the evidence demonstrates, or the discovery demonstrates, that Moss Harris uh, loved and cared for his son. There's been nothing turned over to us in discovery that demonstrates a history of indifference toward Cooper Harris. In fact, the state's discovery uh, demonstrates that Ross shared in the parenting responsibilities, I mean, really in every possible respect, Took him to the, took him on vacation, took him to the beach, took him to Braves games, uh, events. Ross participated in daycare. Um, and via private messaging on the very day Cooper died. And some of this messaging is, was uh, of a sexual nature. And uh, the uh, part of the evidence we received that there was a uh, single uh, prior liaison. But there's no suggestion 
in any of the communication with this individual that Ross is to look, looking to live a life without his family by getting rid of his wife or by killing his child. There's no suggestion in the communication with this individual that there's any animus toward his son. To the contrary, when looking at the communications with this person less than two months before Cooper's death, Ross was communicating with this person about taking Cooper to the Braves game, actually sent her a photograph of Cooper at the <coughs> Again, I submit to the court that if, if, if the defense were seeking to put this evidence in, it rebuts the state's theory of motive, and it, and it shows the nature of the relationship between the parties, father and son, that it was a very good relationship. In the discovery, we received information about communications with a person identified as X Jack X Lynx, X J A C K I E X L Y N N X. And according to the discovery, Ross communicated with this person via a private messaging app, and some of the messaging was of a sexual nature. And some of, the, some of the discovery received uh, indicates a possible prior, uh, single prior uh, liaison. But there's no suggestion in any of the communication with this individual e either that Ross is looking to live a life without his family or looking to somehow get rid of his wife by killing his son. Or, or, or any, any fashion, anyway. There's no suggestion in the communication with this person of any animus toward his son. To the contrary, three weeks before Cooper's death, Ross communicated with this person about his son and characterized Cooper as perfect. Two months before Cooper's death, Ross communicated with this person by describing his relationship with his wife as great and characterized his son, Cooper, as the best ever. He's the best. Now again, if it's the defense seeking to admit this kind of extrinsic or other, other, other acts, it's, it's, it obviously shows the nature of the relationship between father and son as being very good. And the farthest thing in the world from this suggestive, suggestive intent to kill and this, this motive to do away with his son. I'm going to move on from I'm going to move on from that judge but in, in summarizing that the individuals that I've just addressed here, these are the folks, these are the folks that the state says Mr. Harris is communicating with that demonstrates he wants to get rid of his son. These are the folks and this is what they had to say. Or this is what Ross said to them in communications. The state's uh, suggested evidence of motive uh, in order to admit um, bad character, uh, other act evidence, includes this um, information that, uh, suggestion that defendant made computer searches that he wanted to live child free. Managed to get that out at the uh, probable cause hearing and uh, the, the media basically ran wild with those two words. Well, we didn't have the discovery at the time of the probable cause hearing or at the time those articles were written. Uh, but the state says, yeah, um, he's, he's searching child free and that, that's evidence of that he wants to get away from his family. So it's evidence of motive to do away with his son. Well, we've reviewed the discovery, and uh, 
what it's what, what we've discovered in reviewing it is that the defendant was not a member of any organization advocating living without children or advocating harming children uh, and what we've received we we can't find where he did any sort of search for any organizations advocating living without children we can't find that that there was a time where he put in uh, uh, any search terms for advocating living without children. The discovery we've received uh, seems to indicate that uh, Mr. Harris clicked on three posts from the Reddit website, R-E-D-D-I-T-T, -T, and it appears that this occurred over a couple of, a couple of minutes. And to refresh the court's recollection, I think we discussed this before, uh, Detective Stoddard may have discussed this before, but Reddit's kind of a news or information clearinghouse where uh, people can share videos and post uh, pictures or thoughts or stories or whatever on basically thousands of subjects, I mean anything you can think of. It's kind of like, it's kind of like my Comcast homepage where there are um, like maybe a one sentence teaser that, that, that would um, on, on some particular subject um, or, or a heading um, which would then take you to another file or to another file. Um, and here, again, what, what we've been given, we, we certainly can't find that there was any particular search terms put in according to discovery. He clicked on three uh, posts. Well, what were these posts that caused uh, this to be a uh, motive for murder um, under their theory. Well, the first post was from a blind man who had trouble dating and apparently has not had much luck on eHarmony or Match.com. Um, obviously there's nothing about that, that post that would suggest that Ross advocated living a life without children. There's nothing about that post to suggest that Ross was motivated to um, do away with his family or to, to do away with his child. In the discovery we've received, it, it appears that there was a uh, click on a second, po uh, second post and it was um, a post from a woman whose family member just got out of prison and the, the woman uh, told her convict parolee family member that she did not want children. And so the, the parolee family member apparently encouraged this lady to have a child and, and allow her to raise it. And, and I would submit to the court again, there, there's, there's nothing about that post in, in any way that suggests advocating that parents should kill their children. The third posts that um, our discovery indicates that uh, was clicked on at some point was from a woman who thought it would be funny to post on Facebook a black and white ultrasound of her IUD and then suggest that she was pregnant and apparently her friends were not amused by that. So again, this is what, you know, this is what the state uh, suggests as evidence that Mr. Harris wanted to live child free. That's the evidence. And they're suggesting that demonstrates motive for wanting to murder his child. Again, nothing in the discovery that we've been provided shows that Ross Harris advocated for living child free, advocated for any child free group, promoted or approved of any such group or philosophy. <clears throat> we did, however, discover uh, in the discovery materials that apparently um, Mr. Harris uh, is however a very um, fierce, has very fierce anti-abortion beliefs, which I think again is, is certainly contrary to what the state is suggesting is made here. So I want to circle back, Judge, if I can now to the state's the state's brief at the severance motion, and I, and I think that's really as good a starting point as any to kind of kind of go through what the what the state's 
how it is they're suggesting to the court that this is um, these uh, again what we're referring to is sexual evidence how it is intrinsic to the charged offenses and so uh, the state's brief goes through a number of cases and what they're suggesting Mr. Uh, Boring argued this uh, matter to the court uh, basically some outrageous kind of cases um, of motive to kill children well uh, uh, we took a look at these cases and I would suggest to the court that they're they're not in any way analogous to to, to our case and and um, I'm going to go through these judge uh, just sort of one by one it's going to take a few minutes the state relies on Connecticut versus the what Connecticut versus West WEST 274 Connecticut 605 it's a 2005 case there the defendant was charged with murder of her boyfriend's children there was evidence that the defendant's boyfriend made queer that he would not move away with her because his children were too important. So the defendant became resentful of the children and of her boyfriend's ex-wife. She was upset about child support her boyfriend had to pay to the children and she grew to hate the ex-wife. And the evidence was that the defendant began to plan on ways to harm the ex-wife. In other words, there, there, there was an enormous amount of evidence of actual ill will toward the defendant and the wife and children, the ex-wife and children, now, in, a, in an attempt to vandalize the ex-wife's home. The children were there. They were, they were killed. <clears throat> well, in this case, there, there's nothing in the discovery that we've been provided uh, demonstrating any sort of ill will or hatred or malicious intent toward Cooper Harris. In, in fact, in, in fact, this case was really the complete opposite of the dynamic between the parties. I mean, West is about a defendant who made it real clear there was substantial uh, dislike and ill will toward the uh, ex-wife and children here the discovery we, re we received judge completely opposite of that uh, this is a good case to look at of what that kind of what, what that kind of evidence is and, and how that how that motive manifested through the evidence State relied on State versus Webb, 70 Ohio, 3rd, 325, 1994. Um, and I'll note, I'll note for the court that there are a lot of Ohio cases that were in the state's brief. Uh, so I assume that they apparently have an intern. versus Webb, the defendant was charged with murder of one son and attempted murder of the rest of the family, and the motive in that case was financial. <clears throat> and there was evidence that the defendant had been stealing money from his, his two oldest children, uh, their inheritance. inheritance. Now, the reason why I want to bring this case up is because of the way the state, what they suggested in their brief. If you'll take a look at their brief, do you know what page that's on, Carlos? Is it 12? Where, wherever in their brief, Judge. What the state suggests is that in this case, there, the extramarital affair that came into evidence was, uh, was motive. And I suggest to the court that it's very misleading because what that opinion actually indicates is that the defendant's relationship with another woman was motive to kill his wife who was a vic also a victim of attempted murder, not motive to kill the deceased child, as if you read the state's brief, that's clearly what they're suggesting. That's not the case. That's not what Webb stands for. Uh, in fact, Webb stands for exactly what we've said and continue to say, which is this. All this, any and all evidence of, uh, of, of infidelity or of a sexual nature could be relevant 
could be evidence of motive if the defendant was charged with murdering his wife. That's not the case. That's not the case here. And that's why um, reliance on, on, on that type of case is, is, is not really going to be helpful to the court in, uh, in making any decisions here. The state relies on State versus Todd, 2015 Ohio, 2682, 2015 case. There, the defendant was charged with murder of her baby daughter by blunt force trauma. The state's theory was that the woman killed her child to obtain an amount of personal freedom. But in that case, there was evidence that the defendant paid little attention to that child. And she'd send the child away so she could go party. There was evidence that she was apparently hooking up with some man the day after the child's funeral, expressed no grief in her child's death. In the discovery we've received, there's no suggestion that um, Ross Harris paid little attention to Cooper. In fact, it's just the exact opposite. He spent lots of quality time with Cooper. The discovery demonstrates a, a very loving parent-child relationship. And in the discovery we've received, there is certainly evidence of intense grieving over the death of his son. The discovery includes a recording of Ross Harris sobbing uncontrollably and calling out to God as his wife tries to console him. So I don't think that the state's reliance on that case is very instructive either. The state relies on state versus Ourswelled, A-U-E-R-S-W-E-L-D, 2013 Ohio. Lexus 653, a 2013 case there. The defendant was charged with murdering his wife. The state's theory of motive was that he wanted to live a bachelor lifestyle and be with other women. In that case, there was evidence of a history of domestic violence. The victim had an ongoing fear of her husband, evidence of ongoing abuse. He met women online after her death messaging with women before death, emails demonstrating he was contemplating divorce. And all of this evidence, is, of course, uh, of course, Judge, would be absolutely relevant uh, as, as other acts type evidence and, and, and motive evidence in a spousal murder, which is, again, we, we don't have that here. And so Ourswelled stands for exactly what we've said, is that infidelity and, and um, evidence of, of, of sexual nature is of outlined in paragraph 7, as well as prior difficulties with your spouse, could be relevant, and it could be motive if the defendant was charged with murdering his spouse. That's not the case here. <clears throat> Judge, I'm um, going to sort of change directions here a little bit and focus on uh, some other cases in the state's brief. They are, um, the state is suggesting that this bad character evidence, um, as I've outlined in paragraph 7, is admissible as intrinsic evidence. Intrinsic, I-N-T-R-I-N-S-I-C. Well, what does that mean? What is intrinsic? How or why is evidence admissible as intrinsic? The state's uh, appropriately laid out the black letter law there in their brief, uh, United States versus Troya and United States versus Edward, E-D-O-U-A-R-D. -E um, what we deem intrinsic evidence is admissible if it is one, an uncharged offense which arose out of the same transaction or series of transactions as the charged offense, two, necessary to complete the story of the crime, three, inextricably intertwined with the evidence regarding the charged offense, evidence not part of the crime charge but pertaining to the chain of events explaining the context, motive, and setup of the crime is properly admitted if linked in time and circumstances with the charged crime or forms an integral and natural part of an account of the crime or is necessary to complete the story of the crime for the jury. Evidence is inextricably intertwined 
if it is an integral and natural part of the witness's accounts and of the circumstances surrounding the offenses for which the defendant is indicted. So review of the cases that the state has submitted in its brief uh, when we argue the severance. Okay, these are the cases that the state is saying warrant admission of this these bad character evidence as intrinsic. And again, Judge, um, there's really no other way for me to go through the cases except to go through the cases. Oh. And, and, and I think it's um, and, and I think it's worthy of our time to do that because these are the cases that the state's relying on. And we that's it, of course. <laughs> that's okay if you want to keep on convincing me when I've already made my mind up. Yeah, I see going through. I I, um, I I as the court indicating that that, that it, you've already made up your mind on on this motion. No. I didn't, I didn't think that's... No, I said I've already made my mind up that you can go through each of them. Yes, ma'am. And you're welcome And I appreciate to that. You've given us two days listen. here, and I, I'm, I'm quite confident we're not going to use all, all two days. I'm not concerned. Um, unless Mr. Lumpkin takes over, then it's a distinct possibility. <laughs> all right, but I'm, I'm, I am going to go through them, and, and I do think it's instructive because, again, these are the cases that the state is relying on to say, hey, this is intrinsic evidence. This is race geste. This is, this is motive. Well, we looked at the cases and they're just not instructive. U.S. versus Ford, 784 F3rd, 1386. This is a 11th Circuit case, 2015. Um, defendant ran a fraudulent tax preparation business uh, by getting individuals' personal information under false pretenses, and then she filed false tax returns and pocketed the refund. And the 11th Circuit found that evidence of other uncharged acts of fraud, such as her own personal returns and, and the returns of other victims, which were not charged in that indictment, uh, were admissible as intrinsic evidence because it was part of the same scheme or series of transactions and uses the same modus operandi as the charged offenses. Well, in Ford, the evidence was intrinsic because it was all the same fraudulent scheme. <coughs> and there's really no uh, similarity in analysis uh, whatsoever. The, I mean, the admissibility in, uh, of the evidence in that case was, was obvious. It was all modus operandi. Uh, so I would suggest to the court that that, that case that it's relying on is, is just no help. Um, I mean, the, the obvious motivation for the bad character evidence that I've outlined in paragraph seven, acts of a sexual nature, communications of a sexual nature. Well, what's the motivation for those? Sexual gratification. That's the motivation. So the methods of obtaining sexual gratification are not the same modus operandi as the alleged killing in this case. The state relies on U.S. versus Troy, a T-R-O-Y-A, 733 F-3rd, 1125. This is an 11th Circuit case, 2013. In Troy, the state wanted to get in evidence of an uncharged uh, shootings as evidence of a drug conspiracy and murder. The shootings were done, in that case, to silence witnesses in furtherance of the drug operation. So what, what you had was a very direct nexus between shooting witnesses and the drug conspiracy and charged murder. The other act, murders in Troya, happened in the middle of running a drug ring, and it, it was an obvious and natural step in the furtherance of a conspiracy. Here, there's no evidence that Ross Harris's uh, uh, sexual behavior or communications intended to serve any other purpose in, in, in carrying out a murder. Sexual behavior and communication are motivated by <clears throat> sexual gratification, not an intent to kill. So it's not connected. The, the, the acts, the bad acts that we're asking the court to exclude, they're not connected in any way of the alleged, of the alleged killing. A, 
a request for nude photos of, of, of a woman is is not done in furtherance of a plan to kill. It is, I think, a, a, the clearest way I can put it. A request for photos of a nude woman is for a specific purpose. That's to get photos of a nude woman. And just, just, just as an example, uh, sort of the way to look at it, Let, let's say the state had evidence that Ross was um, with a prostitute in 2013, let's say a year before Cooper Harris's death. Well, nothing about what that witness would have to say would be integral to an account of the alleged murder of his child. It's an unrelated, uncharged act which serves its own purpose. Um, completely unconnected to the suggested uh, motivation to kill a year later. Well, what is it really? It's bad character evidence. And that's why we're asking the court to exclude it. And that's why the state wants it in. The state relies on State versus Jensen, J-E-N-S-E-N, -E -E 331, Wisconsin 2nd, 440, 2010 case. Again, state's relying on uh, a, spou a spousal murder case. Husband poisons his wife. And the state's motive theory was that the defendant was intentionally torturing his wife for an affair that she had had years earlier, and he was still obsessed about it. He admitted to detectives that he was displaying photos of erect penises around his home in order to upset his wife when they would argue. And so these photographs were admissible because there was a direct link between the photos around the house when the wife's murdered body was discovered and defendants admitted motive using the photos to upset, upset her. The Wisconsin Supreme Court recognized that evidence of the defendant's ill feeling toward his wife is relevant to prove motive. But basically, the, the pornographic images was evidence of the nature of the relationship between the parties, husband and wife, and explained why he killed his wife. There was a direct link between the evidence and the killing. I mean, essentially, the, the evidence gave viability to the motive under those circumstances. Here, in those instances when Cooper is occasionally mentioned in the other acts, uh, bad evidence, in communications with these other individuals, those communications all cut squarely against the state's suggested motive um, because it's all good it's all positive it's all loving in nature and when the subject of cooper comes up in these other acts it shows the nature of the relationship between the parties is loving so i would suggest i'd ask the court to take a look at state versus jensen because this case could not possibly be more different. The other acts the state seeks to introduce makes, this, makes the, theory, the state's theory less viable. So, again, why does the state want all these bad acts, uh, sexual communications and evidence? Because it's bad character evidence. Just like, just like in Jensen, you know, it might be relevant. It might be evidence of motive. If Mr. Harris was charged with killing his spouse, he was not. The state relies on the state versus D. Bartolo, D I B A R T O L O 101, Washington, <coughs> App 1039. This was a 2000 unpublished opinion. Again, a spousal murder case where there was evidence of a causal relationship between the murder and an extramarital affair. Then it was charged with the murder of his wife and uh, moved to exclude evidence of an extramarital affair. There was evidence that the defendant had told his lovers that he wanted to divorce his wife, that they were having financial problems, and that he was tired of his wife nagging him about his affairs. Okay, that in that case, Judge, that's obviously intrinsic. It's it's evidence of the nature of the relationship between the parties. It's race jest. It's motive. Here, the other act's evidence of talking about 
do not demonstrate the nature of the relationship uh, between the parties, Ross Harris, the defendant, and Cooper Harris, the victim. And again, when the subject does come up, it, it demonstrates a loving relationship. The state relies on U.S. versus Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L, 764 F3rd 880. This is a, an Eighth Circuit decision in 2014. Defendant there is charged with sex trafficking by force, fraud, and coercion in child, se uh, child sex trafficking. The defense moved to exclude evidence of prior assaults of the adult victim named in the indictment spanning the seven-month relationship. Evidence was obviously admitted in that case because it was part of the race jest. It was intrinsic evidence because those assaults were intrinsic to the exercise of coercion of that victim. I mean, frankly, I just I don't see how that this case is ins instructive that uh, other acts is raised just in this case. Uh, in Campbell, it was it was obviously in, in transit because it's the same victim. Um, I mean, here Cooper Harris is not a party to the other acts which the state seeks to introduce. So I just don't think that, that case doesn't tell us anything. State relies on Brown versus the state, 270 Georgia 601, 1999 case. The defendant murdered his daughter's stepfather because he believed that the victim was molesting his daughter. His motive for the killing was that the victim molested his daughter. The state moved to exclude evidence of motive, which frankly seems uh, obviously intrinsic uh, to the alleged offense, but the court that motive because there was because there was no nexus between the purported motive and the actual shooting. <clears throat> and sh I mean, in other words, the the child wasn't being molested at the time of the shooting. She wasn't even there at the time of the shooting. So, so there wasn't any nexus. Um, but. I, and I remember this case from 1999, and there was a, there's a, a somebody wrote this in, it may have been Hunstein. Uh, I think it's an interesting case. What I want the court to keep in mind is just because a party says it's their theory of motive, it doesn't mean that evidence that it suggests supports the motive is, is admissible. Um, I mean, here the state wants to put in evidence of bad character, evidence and infidelity, and sexual communications and, and package it as extrinsic evidence, which it suggests is motive. But like Brown, I'd submit to the court that it's not borne out in the discovery that we've received. Um, there's no nexus between the sexually related other acts evidence and the state's suggested motive. Nothing about those other acts has got anything to do with the death of Cooper Harris. Uh, and as I've said over and over and over, uh, if anything, the other acts of bad character that they want to put in demonstrate a lack of intent to kill Cooper Harris. The state, the state relies on Cook versus the state, 274 Georgia, 891, the 2002 case, and uh, we all probably remember when this happened, um, the, the defendant shot and killed his mother and uh, he sought to exclude evidence um, that he had used and sold marijuana. The court permitted that, uh, that evidence that he used and sold marijuana and that he had problems at school. Why? Because there was a direct nexus with the killing. Those bad acts caused friction between he and his mother. Again, it goes to the nature of the relationship between the parties. And <coughs> here, th th there's no such nexus in the bad character evidence that the state wants to inject into the case. Mr. Harris's sexual activity and communications didn't involve Cooper Harris. That's the bottom line. The state relies on State versus Dorsey, 279, Georgia 534. That's a 2005 decision. Um, 
and, and, and obviously we, we all remember this case as well. This was a, a murder in, in a RICO case where the state presented two theories, two motives, uh, that the victim, the newly elected Derwin Brown, was killed to uh, was killed to prevent the former sheriff, Dorsey, from being investigated and exposed for corruption. And that Brown was killed to allow Dorsey to regain his position as the sheriff. And of course, um, the motive was supported by the by the evidence. In, in that case, the state's relying on is is an obvious classic motive. I just don't think that this case is instructive um, in, in any way. Uh, here, unlike Dorsey, there is no direct nexus between the, the bad acts the state wants to get into and the death of Cooper Harris. The state relies on Sterling versus the state, 89 Georgia 807. That's an 1892 case. The case involved the murder of a security guard killed, uh, apparently killed a a co-worker, another security guard, the state's theory of motive was that the killing was done to prevent the victim from taking his job. The defendant objected to the state's closing argument wherein the prosecutor suggested that the jury could either accept or reject the state's theory of motive. And of course, the, prose the prosecutor could make such an argument because there was actual evidence of the motive. So again, this is, this is a case that they're relying on. It's got nothing to do with the admission of extrinsic evidence or, or raised just a. <clears throat> but these are the cases that, that, that are stacked up in the state's brief. They're asking you to rely on. Judge, I, I, um, just, to, just to give you an idea, I. I've got a, a little bit way to go, and I'm I'm good to push right through. But I knew that you had you had a little cold or something. So if you wanted to, to break, I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem. With that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. um, they're relying on Sullivan versus the state, 284 Georgia 358. That's a 2008 decision. Their defendant paid a person to kill his wife. Must be helpful. Yeah, she's gonna take ten minutes. You can keep on going, but I'm all in. Okay. <laughs> I, um, but since you offered. I apparently was so excited for you to hear the next section of my argument, Judge. Uh, but I. Um, this is a good stopping point. Thank you, Let's Judge. Let's take a break. <laughs> Thank you. 